This is the KJ Show. The KJ Show with host Dr. Katherine Johnson is a mix of breaking news and practical advice on the many ways in which the energy industry can affect you and your family. Catherine will combine energy updates and conversations with leaders in the energy efficiency community. So please welcome your host, Dr. KJ. Hello and welcome to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network, or should I say Bold B2. Um, today I'm talking about something that's really interesting and again, one of those unintended consequences of energy, of energy actions and climate change initiatives, green colonialism. How the rush to install nucle- uh, renewable energy hydro plants and, and wind power actually adversely affects indigenous people. So one of my favorite quotes from the articles this week is, is it green energy if it's destroying tribal land? Great question, and we'll discuss that today. But I always like to start with the fun stuff. And this, in the theme of being green, and that's why I'm wearing tropical today, is because of green colonialism going in and doing more damage in the name of doing good things. Um, But the first thing that really uh, cracked me up is, um, you know, these dating services, they have ads all the time, eHarmony and all these other ones, Bumble. I don't know. I, I have no idea. But there's a lot of dating services out there. But now they're starting to have a new requirement. It isn't just that you have to have a nice picture and a good job and all those things. You now actually are starting to be judged as to whether or not you're acceptable for the green dating app based on your feelings about the environment. And the questions you know, that they have to help you understand and find your ideal match are so skewed that if you don't believe that there's a climate crisis or if you're not concerned about environmentalism, they won't even let you in the service which is really silly. A green dating is a term that basically means search for the romantic, eco-conscious individual who shares their values and their desires for action on climate change. So I guess that leaves my boys out because <laughs> they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're all about wanting to change the world and be good, but their views of climate change are probably a little different, probably because their father's a meteorologist. Um, so I guess no green dating apps for them. But uh, as a Vuni relationship trends, green dating was born from a necessity for singles who wanted to make sure that their values aligned with the person that they're dating. Now, I understood, you know, back when, when, you know, a few years ago, Christian Mingle came out, makes sense. You know, obviously you don't want to go on a dating app and find, you know, some schizophrenic or some sociopath. And obviously if you're looking for compatibility. But I never thought that your views on the environment were such a deal breaker, but apparently it is. And so 75% of British adults admitting that being concerned about the climate is in future is very important in having a partner. Okay. Uh, dating apps like Bumble and Elite Six Sing Singles have also catered to this eco green dating app theory, and they offer indicate interest while other smaller apps like Green Singles and Grazers are popping up too. So there's a whole now subset of environmentally conscious individuals who can get together and talk about each other, which I guess makes sense because in some ways, green energy, you know, is almost becoming, has become a religion. So you don't maybe align on religious values, but if you align on, um, you know, saving the earth, then I guess that's a good thing. But the problem is, the problem that I have is that the way that the questions are worded is the people who don't buy into the green agenda aren't even on the app. They're not even allowed. It seems a little um, prejudicial. The Bumble said that the environmentalism is one of the top values added to daters in their profiles in the UK, and that individuals who added value-related interest to their pages, a quarter of them said caring about the planet should be a top priority. Gee, when I was dating, I was more interested in finding someone to be a good, stable partner and share the same religious and values I had. I didn't you know, pollution nobody is in favor of, and, and it just seems interesting. So that, but now apparently on a first date, climate conversations are really important. And one of my favorite quotes from this article was, it was really funny. It said that there's displaying, displaying your stance on climate justice serves as an overt w- warning to filter out anyone who can't get on board. Gee, this is an open-minded community, right? Um, another one says it would be a deal breaker to discover if her date had no desire to learn about caring for the environment. She could only get past ignorance if there was space for open-mindedness and self-development. It doesn't seem very open-minded. And another guy said he'd actually been eco-catfished. 
he went on a dating site and then he found out later that that you know he's really mad because there are the true believers and then there are ones who are just fraudulent saying they were and they were nice people but and but ultimately their values weren't in line with what i expected them to be from their profiles and he said it was easy for anyone to state they care about the environment when they really don't eco catfished that's a new term i've never heard but it sounds interesting and you know in this world of trying to find a partner i guess if you're that feel that strongly about climate change and environmental care then i guess it's good to find a partner but i never really thought of it being a deal breaker but all right <laughs> It is what it is. Now, in the other fun stuff that I can't make up, I really had, couldn't stop, um, you know, laughing at the irony of this, of this, of the news. And the more you dig into the energy industry, the more ironic the news becomes. So the environmentalists were really happy when New York shut down its nuclear power plant a few years ago, saying it's going to, you know, eliminate emissions, and they're gonna, it's gonna get rid of this evil nuclear power plant, but we talked about last week how nuclear power is actually coming back, and environmental activists were so excited, they celebrated the closure of a key nuclear power facility in New York State. But guess what? Emissions have increased, not decreased. Why? Because nuclear is clean, and you know what they had to do? They thought they were gonna get wind and solar projects, but they didn't, and I've talked about why, because the prices have fallen off the market. So what they ended up having to do was to import energy from other states, like and natural gas and fossil fuels, and then they also had to import energy from other nuclear plants in other states. So the cost of importing actually l increased their emissions. So it was exactly the opposite of their intended effect, which seems to be a recurring theme in the energy industry. So. Um, about three years ago, after the plant, after three years after the plant was shut down, the state has seen a sharp increase in greenhouse gas emissions attributable to power generation, due in part to the increased reliance on natural gas that made up for the closed plant output. Now, this was an analysis put together by J.P. Morgan, the bank, the banking industry. In 2020 and 2021, New York shut down the Indian Point nuclear power plant and with the intention of replacing it with renewable energies. Of course, intentions are good, but it doesn't work. And that's not what happened. Instead, they had to get th reserves for three natural gas plants, Bayonne Energy and a few others in the central, in the Cricket Valley Energy Center have had to close the gap because the renewable sources weren't ready. Now, don't you think if you're gonna shut down a renewable or elect a nuclear power plant, you want to make sure you have the alternative generation sources up and running before you shut it down, especially in a populated area like New York? Oh, well, that would be too thoughtful, wouldn't it? And also too rational. So the New York State established the goals of producing 70% of electricity with green generation by 2030, but guess what? It's not going to happen. And J.P. Morgan's analysis demonstrates that natural gas and imports have plugged the gap much more than wind or solar. And my favorite quote from this article is, Texas has is, is you know politically red, but it has more wind power than New York. So Texas is actually more green than New York. Wow, who'd have thought? So megawatt power generation didn't materialize in the ways they wanted it. I wonder if the environmentalists have anything to say about that. Um, anyway, it was an interesting analysis from J.P. Morgan, and it shows again um, just how ill-conceived some of these ideas are when they come and interfere with our energy supply. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host. You're watching The KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network, and I'll be back with some more fun stuff. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author 
Radio show host and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV Network. And today I'm talking about something that I stumbled across earlier in my shows and I kind of glossed over it and I thought, hmm, that's worth exploring. It's called green colonialism. And it's a derogatory term to be sure, because what happens is it's the indigenous peoples who are forced out of their land for the name of developing renewable energy and wind projects. And to me, the irony is you're supposed to be wanting to save these lands, but somehow clean energy trumps indigenous people's rights. And now don't we have a whole DEI initiative to sort of say we shouldn't be doing these things? But apparently that doesn't stop the green energy developers nor the governments from allowing it to happen. And it's actually quite, I think, unforgivable. Uh, so globally, indigenous people manage or have tenure over 36 million square kilometers in 87 countries. And they have different political distinctions inhabited. It represents about a quarter of the world's land. So now you know why it's happening, right? It's where it's, it's where they want to. It's land that they can use. So about forty percent of all of the protected areas, though, of the world are in indigenous peoples' land. So while they're rarely, but these indigenous peoples aren't consulted when somebody says a developer says we want to put up a wind farm or we want to put up a solar, or we want to put in more hydro and, and destroy your sacred lands. Um, indigenous peoples have had regularly had their rights stripped by conservation organizations. Well, that seems sad, not only ironic, it seems kind of evil, that they, who are meant to be stewards of the environment. Hmm. This is why I always kind of scratch myself when I start head, head starting thinking about all these, you know, un, ill-conceived and unthought out, well, un Ill-conceived ideas is a good way to put it. Green col colonialism is very pervasive, much more pervasive than people realize. So um, it takes place when a, within a country too. Interestingly, as we invest in more renewable energy, other conservation activities, it oftentimes at the expense of marginalized communities, the indigenous peoples. So here we have an initiative in America to try and you know hit, correct historical injustices. But at the same time, the people that are perpetrating these historical injustices are the ones who are trying to tell us that we have to get off, we have to get off fossil fuels, and we have to get off natural gas, and we have to get off nuclear, um, because it's not really green, and we have to basically destroy these lands. So the intentions are good, but you know what the word road to hell is paved with. But a conservation group, for example, wants to save a forest in a protected area so corporations can't you know, log it. But the problem is if they're protecting a forest that is, has sacred value and importance to these indigenous communities, like it's their hunting ground or it's their cultural forest or it has meadows where they, where they survive, then they're actually kept out of something that's part of their sacred traditions. Um, and unfortunately, green colonialism happens all over the world and in places you wouldn't even suspect it. For example, Norway, um, and I've talked about the Sammy reindeer before, but there's this new, there was this wind power plant that was announced in a location where the Sammy uh, indigenous reindeer herder people live. And, um, and they've herded reindeer for centuries. And 98% of Norway's electricity comes from renewable, primarily wind. But the impact has actually been very devastating to the traditional Sammy livelihoods. The problem is the wind turbines affect the migration of these reindeer, which is their livelihood. 
They spend their whole, that's what that the, the reindeer are their life. Uh, that's how they make a living. They, the, because guess what? The reindeer don't like the wind turbines. The community, um, the hydropower plants have also caused problems. They weaken the ice so the reindeer, when they're migrating, could die. They also, um, uh, reindeer try to avoid grazing in areas where they can see or hear rain, wind turbines. And one project would disrupt the migration, and that can actually lead to more deaths of reindeer who have just given birth or are pregnant, and because it makes it harder for them, it may longer migration route. So here we have wind power, which is supposed to be really good for the planet, isn't really good for the people who live there. And it isn't really good for the indigenous peoples. And I'm wondering what, what, what do environmentalists think about this paradox? This is why it's called green colonialism, because it really is taking advantage of the least, um, well, the most vulnerable people. And we talk a lot about energy vulnerability, but apparently it doesn't matter if you're going to put up a hydro plant or a, a wind turbine. They don't really care about the reindeer herders. In fact, the Norwegian government was terrible. They, the herders actually filed a lawsuit and, and they got a court of appeal. They wanted to stop the wind turbine or the wind farm from being developed. They said it damages their lands, it hurts their livelihoods. But instead of stopping the wind turbine development, they got money, which, you know, they got paid off. But basically, it reinforced the tendency of the Norwegian government to, and the industry to sell the indigenous rights in the name of development and resource extraction. So they'll say, okay, we'll pay you a bunch of money for your for your inconvenience, but we're not going to stop building this plant. But that's what's causing the damage. So it was very difficult, even though they, and even though it cost them um, about $9 million, the, the Sami didn't want the money, they wanted their land back. Similarly, in Indonesia, had all kinds of problems with um, Indonesia's people from Brazil have found that most aggressive land grabbing is being done by conservation organizations. A forest can be rebranded carbon offsets, and I've talked about those before, and is designated um, by, you know, so the traditional people can't go and live in their forests like they have for centuries because now it's carbon offsets and they're, they're kicked out basically. Oh, they want to preserve about um, 80,000 hectares, which I did the math, it's about 116,000 acres of forests, of uh, which uh, about um, 60, 70,000 acres are threatened with the oil. So the oil companies were coming in, but now the environmentalist groups have come in and said, well, you know, you can't, oil companies can't come and can't come in and drill for oil and you can't come and uh, farm the forest, but you can't come either because it's now protected and the indigenous people are being kicked out of their own land. Uh, the director of the environmental rights for Nigeria says that the Friends of the Earth has denounced the joint press release saying, we've suffered from shells destruction of communities and biodiversities as well as oil spills and illegal gas flaring. Now we can add financing and greenwashing profits to the long list of uh, atrocities. So this is, this is actually really disturbing. Um, they've also had all kinds of problems in Africa. Not surprising, and I've talked about, is this, num is this timing correct? I don't think so, um, but anyway. Uh, so the green, uh, they developed in, in Africa, um, developing carbon offsets has been quite a lucrative business. And I've talked about how they were actually putting elephants on game preserves under the name of carbon offsets and then shooting them, uh, white game hunters, big game hunters, Ugh, atrocious. But in, there's tree plantations and carbon offsets and examines the African forestry impact. And apparently what they've found out is that an Australian investment firm has actually, again, done what we said, green colonialism. The president of Kenya is promoting the continent and says, oh, here, come, we'll do carbon offsets. But at the same time, um, we don't have uh, enough. We're, not, we're taking the land away from those people. So far from benefiting at the African nation, the expansion of carbon markets sustains the status quo and continues with this horrible misuse, again, and, and, and land grab of people who are the most vulnerable, the people that these organizations are supposed to help. That to me is despicable. But I'll have more. Uh, this is Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. I'm talking about green colonialism today on the KJ Show, and I'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like... 
I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. And welcome back to The KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV Network. And today I'm talking about a really disturbing unintended consequence, or maybe it's intended, of green colonialism. And, you know, I talked about it, how it's happening in Africa, but unfortunately it's happening here in the United States too. And it's adversely affecting the Native American tribes and the indigenous peoples in, in, in our own country. Um, so it's not just some isolated problem building wind farms and, and hydro plants overseas. It happens right here, literally in our own states. Uh, green uh, So in, one of the problems are that a lot of Native American tribes are really upset in Oregon with these offshore energy plants. The Confederated Tribes of Coes, which is a bunch of different Indian tribes, are, quote, extremely disappointed because the federal plans were finalized. This is the federal government to build two offshore energy projects without the tribe's consultation or approval or anything. The tribe reaction says that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management announced their plans were finalized to build an offshore wind agency near their near the Coos Bay, but the plans to build these offshore wind turbine would actually total about 195,000 acres and would avoid, um, they said, 98% of the things. They would also have about 2.4 gigawatts of renewable energy. So it's a big deal, 190, you know, 195,000 acres. But the tribe says that that actually interferes with their historic fishing areas and their ancestral territories. Yes, they were there first, right? Um, the tribe has consistently asked this agency to exclude important fishing areas from wind energy development. And this is their, their sacred right. The fishing is an important industry on the coast and employs a lot of tribal businesses. Fishing, including salmon, are important cultural and subsistence resource. And any impact on fish from wind development is going to harm their jobs and their tribe. Um, and we have serious concerns with the environmental impacts that may occur as a result of this development. We simply don't know yet how extensive that'll be. So you can imagine the federal government is going to go ahead and build two big offshore wind uh, plants at the expense of tribal lands. And I thought, I thought this federal government especially was supposed to be really concerned about being uh, open-minded and making sure we protect cultural institutions. And it seems like this is just all of um go ahead and pull yeah go ahead and pull that up um we forgot the sammy picture yeah there it is so this is actually how it's going to happen so this is actually spreading all across the northeast um and i love this quote if green energy is it green energy if it's impacting cultural traditional sites that's a really great question and no one is answering asking that and no one in the in the regular media that talks about all these renewable energy plants points out the utter hypocrisy of using renewable energy to destroy important lands, the you know the destruction it causes. So for five years, the tribal staff have been fighting renewable energy development that could permanently destroy tribal cultural property. 
Well, it's not like the first time we've actually broken our promises to the Native Americans, right? Um, I lived in a little town in my book, Grit and Granite, lived right next to an Indian reservation. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a history across the country of not treating the Native Americans who were here before us fairly and breaking our promises. Well, here's another one. Um, this, one uh, comp- this one organization has been trying to fight this proposal from a developer up in Rye called Rye that has efforts required efforts of attorneys, archeologists, government staffers from a different, a lot of different departments to basically finding the staff to do the important location. And they're saying the RISE project, this one, is just one of dozens proposed in the Yakima area here, 10 million acre treaty area. Maps from the tribe and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife show that 51 solar and wind projects are being proposed not including geothermal or other types, and at least 34 are on part of their lands, the Yakima Nation lands. So this is the map of where they want to put in all these things and see how these plant, these, these, these uh, power, these renewable energy plants are, you know, being basically taken over their sacred land. Thank you for that. Um, the advocacy group called, I don't need the thing anymore. The advocacy group called Cultural Survival in partnership with other organizations have also highlighted that they want, there's now the whole rush for minerals because we have this whole new push about EV cars and we've talked a lot about how much precious minerals they use, lithium and those things. Well, apparently there's a lot of those minerals on Indian lands and there's a big rush to get them. And that's also another encroachment, another form of green colonialism. Um, basically, as countries scramble to uphold pledges to keep global warming at the Paris levels of 1.C, businesses and governments are latching on to environmentally driven projects such as needs for water, mineral needs, and wind power, usurping the rights of the indigenous peoples, um, American Southwest and the Arctic and in Africa. Um, a, a chairman of the Shoshone Paiute tribes says that the Indian Reservation in Nevada has had 70 or so lithium mining applications. Targeting the Paiute lands has been expensive, um, and it's basically considered the cornerstone of the UN Declaration of Rights that they're going after it because, oh, well, you know, we put you on these lands. Now, these weren't necessarily their original lands, but that's where they got stuck after they were relocated, right? So now we're taking away those lands, and we're not even... and and Gosh, we can't even let them benefit from these mining applications. He said the lithium extraction efforts are fast track to supply the Biden's administration with net zero strategy to create all these cars. Um, it's kind of just being rammed down our throats, this uh, chairman said, at the cost of the indigenous peoples once again. So have we learned anything? And so is green conservation really just another form of uh, uh, exploitation by green by green energy, you know, by green environmentalists. And it, to me, it's a very big concern because, you know, I'm all for saving the planet, but I don't want to say, I don't want to put in renewable energy plants like wind and solar and hydro that actually damage the pristine places where these indigenous peoples have a right to live. I mean, we've already treated them pretty badly for the last couple centuries, at least. Why are we continuing to do it? And ironically to me, the people that are foisting these new plans are are the very ones who said they care about these people. These are they you know they they care about the environment and that's why they're pushing green energy. Well, they don't really care about the consequences of putting up a wind farm or putting up a solar farm that actually interferes with historic fishing. Then you're destroying communities in the sake of, for what? Especially when wind and solar has been demonstrated not to be as effective long-term solution. They are, have intermittent power supplies. Um, and so the very people who would oppose um, the putting in fossil fuels are also the ones who are in favor of dislocating and dislodging Native Americans. To me, the irony and the hypocrisy is astounding. And it's worrisome. But that's why I'm here. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the for the K-Day show on the Bold Brave TV network. I've been talking about green colonialism and next section I'll open it up to my callers and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? 
Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick. Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV Network, and today I've been talking about the hypocrisy of green colonialism. But I always want to open it up to have this segment for folks to call in and, and talk about whatever they'd like in the world of energy. Um, so I think uh, we'll have a caller in a minute. But one of the things um, I found to sort of just make life interesting, you want to put that picture up real quick of the squirrel in the map? So this is the most interesting thing I found. Oh, never mind. We'll wait. We'll see. Keep the squirrel up. Or you actually take it down. Because John, I'll talk to John first, and then I'll talk about the squirrel. So, um, hi, John. How are oh, you? That's a nice squirrel. <laughs> it's a funny story. <laughs> so how are you? So what's your question of the day? Hi, Catherine. Yeah, good morning. Um, my, my question is, I, I missed the first part of the show, but I'm wondering when the federal government or the energy companies requisition the land or seize the land, uh, the tribal lands for power projects, do they give anything back to the tribal communities or is it just like, screw you, we're going to do this? It's pretty much the latter. It's like um, the federal government has control, even though it's lands that are historically controlled by these indigenous peoples. And that's what the problem is. They don't have the same rights. So um, even though these lands were given to them, right, as part of treaties and, you know, they, they kicked them out of where they were before and now they put them in these other places and now they're coming in and destroying their fishing. And so they don't have any, any um, you know, recourse. Uh, same thing in Norway. They'd rather pay the Sammy herders millions of dollars than stop the wind development that's basically ruining and endangering their, their way of life and, and harming their reindeer. So... It's just like, we'll just throw, maybe they give them money. I, I don't, that didn't really seem to come up. It's mostly that they're coming in and they're encroaching on these lands in the name of federal, you know, federal policies and how that's more important than these indigenous rights. But that's not any different than what the way we treated the Native Americans back in the 1800s when we marched them, you know, trail of tears and things. Um, so, but the thing that gets yeah. me is the fact that these are liberals that are doing this. These are people that are supposed to be protecting these things. These are people in the, in the you know, for the name of energy, um, we're gonna have to displace and, in, and further, um, you know, ruin indigenous peoples because, well, you know, our energy needs are more important than your land. It's the utter hypocrisy is what gets me. And, and, yeah. and then the conservation yeah. groups. Thank you. And the, yeah, and then the conservation groups who want to protect the Amazon forest at the expense of the people who've lived in the Amazon for centuries. So, to me, thank you, John, for calling in. Great question, as always. Now we yeah. want to put up the squirrel, yeah. because the squirrel is really fun. You're going to like the squirrel story, John, I promise. Um, so, one of the things that I've always worried about is when we have non-trained, untrained observers 
who take pictures and distort facts. And that comes in a lot of the climate news, by the way. It's not really done by people who are professionals. So this is a great example. Now we're talking about squirrels in St. Louis. And this researcher came and found out that, that the people's impressions of what is happening is completely wrong, which is one of the reasons I think a lot of climate change is, news is, is incorrect too. So she, this woman who was a researcher wrote about bias and community science data. And what she did is she basically noticed that they had two maps. One showed the racial segregation that had happened with the northern half being mostly black and the southern half predominantly white. And the other showed where the sightings of the eastern gray squirrels were and had been recorded on this app Naturalist used by phone-wielding photographers. Judging by the app, there were no, virtually no squirrels in the city's black neighborhoods who said, well, maybe there was urbanization or maybe, but she knew it wasn't true. Um, squirrels are abundant in the northern part of the city as well as the southern part, but there were no recorded observations. Why is that? Maybe because people on, in the other communities have better things to do than take pictures of squirrels. Her insight actually developed into a conversation about scientists and how peer review, in a peer-reviewed paper about the blind spots and biases that can skew data gathered through informal amateur networks. And I would put the UN climate change report in that as it has been discredited many times by hundreds of scientists who actually wrote, wrote, the, wrote the paper and then it got politically changed. So, you know, so this immature or amateur, I should say, approach. So basically citizen science has become an important part of biodiversity research. Yeah, but it isn't accurate and it isn't true and it creates bias. And whether it's volunteers collaborating or researchers tapping into apps, but just posting pictures examined that in late February, they documented a population crash of humpback whales in the Pacific. Problem was it wasn't true and it just skewed the data. And St. Louis scores that data can pursue results that have little to do with actual natural history and a lot to do with human society. So if we have biases affecting how in the world we think how squirrels are distributed across the city of St. Louis based on postings of people taking pictures of squirrels, how is that different than people saying, oh, you know, it, was, it hasn't snowed last year, therefore there must be climate change? No, it's called weather. Uh, we need to be very conscious, this researcher says, about how the, we're using this data and how we're interpreting where the animals are. And basically, she wrote with 13 other scientists around the country, say, a cautionary road track, roadmap of the ways that bias can creep into data gathering and resulting pictures of the natural world. So here's a scientist who actually admits that when you have, you know, amateur people, bias creeps in. I think bias creeps in regardless, but the data depends on who participates and where they're located and observations tend to be skewed. Um, likewise, wealthier people are more likely to take pictures and take part in citizen science and increase the likelihood the data will come from where they live. So the racial disparities can reflect on social and economic inequities, but have also emerged in, in climate, climate, citizen science where white participants are overrepresented. This is a really disturbing trend to me um, because what that means is, and unfortunately we know we hear all about, um, we hear all about, you know, it's gonna be, it's been a really bad weather for the snow, snow for the ski resorts and the, it's not as snowy as it used to be. Well, people forget this is, you know, we have to look at centuries of data. And by the way, the place where I live, I have a place out in uh, Uray, Colorado, Telluride is getting lots of snow. So the, the, the point is you can't just take one data from one point and project it across um, the entire spectrum. This, you know, when I was getting my doctorate, one of the things I learned really important was to do triangulation, is to gather data from multiple perspectives because you can have bias and everybody does and everybody has their own, their own opinions about things. But that's why we need to talk to a lot of different people. The climate movement, and this is a good example of bias creeping in, has kind of formed this opinion and then only allows the data that reinforces that opinion into the argument. And if you disagree with it, you're in big trouble. So I thought this citizen science project that showed that squirrels were actually equally distributed in St. Louis, but if you look at what people think, they're wrong. So how is that not different than what people think about the climate? if they're just based on their own observations and their amateurs. It says a lot. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. You're watching The KJ Show, and I'll be right back. 
Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, Hope, and Support for Caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. And today I've been talking about green colonialism. And I really want to point, make this really very important observation. Green colonialism is just another form of carbon offsets. And I've talked about the evils of carbon offsets. Even Bill Gates doesn't think carbon offsets are any good. To me, they're more like the indulgences that the Catholic Church used to sell to help us get into heaven back and to build the cathedrals. But carbon offsets are the form of, you know, you're going to offset your carbon. And you, you, buy, you fly on a plane and you can buy carbon offsets. But the thing is, it's really not only a fraud. It's actually more of a scam, too. But, and most of the carbon offsets, guess what? They, they are in, located in poor countries by people who don't get any revenue whatsoever and they're the least po politically powerful groups are being, again, harmed by these carbon offset schemes. This puts them in competition for land and they really can't, you know, so they're basically putting in carbon offsets, we're going to set aside this forest, but that's where the indigenous people live. Uh, a research institute in, reported that Norway's company's quest to buy and conserve forest land in East Africa to use for carbon offsets came at the cost of forced evictions and food scarcity for thousands of Ugandans, Mozambique, and Tanzanians. Um, how is that right? How is that fair? How is that good for the planet when you were evicting poor people? Efforts to boost energy security can drive colonialism as well. African continents, paradoxically, are both home to the world's largest solar plant in Morocco, are also the least connected to the grid. And the other thing that's happening is these European countries are using the power from these um, carbon emissions, from these you know green energy in other countries, and, and that's how they're using it to offset their own. Um, solar power may end up giving Africans more access to electricity, but many larger renewable energy projects in North Africa actually go to Europe. They don't even benefit them. And they're bolstering energy, European energy security, but they're not really helping the Africans. And a coordinator of the African Network for Solar Energy said, it's large-scale solar farms with foreign power grids is a new form of resource exploitation. And it is. And it's green colonialism. And it's really not something that people talk about. And they should. So many Europeans' most carbon-intensive industries have relocated outside the EU and, but they're still making profits, you know, still making products. And the emissions, they're actually outsourcing their greenhouse gas emissions. They've allowed these European countries to appear virtuous. 
um, even though they're simply moving the emissions around the, the globe. France, Italy, and Germany are among the world's top importers of embedded carbon in the form of cars, machinery, domestic applications. The EU has been able to cu cut emissions by shifting to clean energy technologies like wind and solar, but it comes again at the expense of the indigenous peoples. A great deal of the lithium for the lithium ion batteries is dug up in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, and much of the cobalt is used in the Congo. So here we are exploiting the resources to build our computers and our EVs and our solar panels. And we're again, at the, for the, in the name of saving the planet, who are we destroying? the vulnerable peoples. Um, this to me is just really sickening. And I get, I get so upset when they don't, no one seems to speak out against these global inequities and the inequities that energy, green energy has actually produced. And why isn't anyone saying this? Where, where's the Red Cross in this? Where is, where is the World Wildlife Foundation? Where are these people that should be concerned about this global dis, you know, eruption. And the risk for, for example, the rush for to create balsa wood, which is used to build wind turbines, has actually led to terrible consequences in the Amazon forest and the indigenous communities. Some of the dirtiest processing from these minerals take place in the global south, like and the single largest rare earth refinery is in Malaysia. Again, we're outsourcing, we're sipping our dirty chemical pollution in the name of we want electric vehicles. We, Biden has mandated electric vehicles now in the United States. At what expense? At the poor people of Malaysia. Uh, because these forms of green colonialism, Europeans' carbon footprints looks good, but it's not really, when you start digging into it, very good at all. And that's the part that really bothers me. And, and I I really don't understand. And this is what my other favorite quote that I found when I was doing my research for this show, that this, this wonderful quote that was so true said, the sad truth of the matter is there is simply not enough accessible lithium for all the cars to shift to electric vehicles or enough iridium and other neodymium for all the solar panels and wind turbines needed to replace oil. So we don't have all the minerals we need to make this shift to 100% net zero clean energy. We don't have it. And I've talked about how expensive it is. Not only is outrageously expensive trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that, client, that John Kerry said, oh, we'll just throw money at it and get it from the banks. No, it's an, it's an unworkable solution. And, and the government isn't paying attention. No governments are paying attention. And they're virtue signaling. They're saying, well, we're, you know, look how good we do in the EU, except they're outsourcing it. And they're they're basically taking the solar energy that's generated in Morocco and they're piping it over to the European benefits at what, it co at what cost and at what expense. The competition among countries and regions to mine, process, and purchase critical raw materials resembles the colonial era gold rush of silver car in the global south, remember? I mean, that's the whole reason European countries went into Africa was to basically get those resources. And they frankly never left and now China's doing it too. Um, a truly equitable energy transition, which nobody, everybody talks about, but nobody does, would address the unequal distribution of energy resources and an, an ener advanced energy democracy. Now, that would be an interesting thought. It would be de-emphasize large-scale institutions, corporate agriculture, huge energy companies, as well as market and in favor of smaller, sustainable, community-led solutions, which to me is the solution. We, you know, why can't we let communities decide how they want to if they want to have solar or wind or hydro in their, in especially indigenous communities. Why isn't the federal government's coming in and telling them, oh, by the way, I know this is your protected sacred land, but we're going to build a hydropower plant or we're going to build a wind turbine. And we don't really care about the impact it has because we need green energy. No, we don't. We can get it with nuclear. We don't need to do these things in the name of clean energy. And I think it's, it's a sham and it just points out how this green energy push isn't really very much based in reality, and it's basically unfair. And that's what bothers me, um, because I'm all for energy democracy, and I'm all for making people self-reliant, but not if we're going to come in on some you know idea that is actually not doesn't make sense financially, economically, or socially. Um, and this is what worries me. Hope, thanks for letting me lecture and get off uh, a little bit of a tangent here. But this is really important stuff, and we never hear about it. So hopefully you're enjoying the show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV Network. You're watching The KJ Show, and I'll be right back with some really fun stuff.
What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host, and today I've been talking about green colonialism and the Bold Brave TV network. But today, I, I, you know me, I love animals. I love, so I have fun stories. I have an update about uh, seals. So we can put up our little seal. The seals are making a comeback in Belgium. I love it. There's a team of volunteers that are helping them coexist with humans. Yeah, yeah my, my dogs like seals too, apparently. They're becoming a increasingly, barley hops, quiet. The seals aren't coming to you. Just just sit put, sit quiet. So anyway, so the seals are actually becoming much more common um, on Belgium's beaches. They, they had actually kind of disappeared in the last century. And there was almost none of them. But now the numbers have been rising. They think there's over in the last 20 years between 100 to 200 gray and seals and harbor seals. And the seals are becoming more accustomed to resting on the beach. Their contact has increased. So now there's a seal team. And I'm not talking about the SEAL team that goes and rescues um, hostages and things, those brave, wonderful men and women, in, men, men in uniform. But they actually are talking about people want to pet the SEALs, and they really are cute. I go to Monterey every couple of years, and the SEALs are adorable. They also, and the otters, and they actually try to tip over your kayak if you let them. Um, but some will even try to th return them to the water. But now they said the North S SEAL team and the municipality has basically said, hands off the seals. After COVID, they decided, no, you're going to leave the seals alone. And they have seal-only zones where people can't go. And they've introduced the rules. People have to stay 30 meters away, about 90 feet from the animals, and obey the golden rule, absolutely cannot feed them. And that is true. When I go to Monterey, the seals are everywhere, along with the otters too. And they're up on the shore and they're barking and they're, you know, but people try to, you know, but they, they have fences up to protect the seals from us, not us from the seals. Though seals can be kind of aggressive. So I'm so glad seals are coming back in Belgium. I didn't realize they were, I had never really thought about seals being in Belgium, but it's wonderful they're coming back, right? One of the good things. Um, and uh, yes, I do love the term seal team. <laughs> and now I have another update. My favorite animals put on the beaver. Beavers in Scotland. Apparently, as I've mentioned on many shows, how, how important beavers are. And, of course, I think beavers are just an amazing creature. But the fifth, of, so there is the Scott estate in Scotland. It's owned by a fifth generation um, owner. Basically decided that he wanted to bring back beavers to Scotland because they were being hunted to extinction. And he thought beavers were really important. He's right. He says, he calls them magicians and how they make these changes um, a beaver occupied pond they, they were talking about. There were a couple, there are now 30, 1,500 beavers living wild in Scotland, um, which could reach over 10,000 by 2030. 
And basically they say 42% of the beavers removed from conflict sites were relocated rather than shot, which is good. They actually had a story about this beaver named Fig that had been shot and they were safe. He was saved. But now what this happens is last summer during the heat wave, they actually relo- they actually released beavers on this in, on the Scottish estate to see what would happen. You know what? They, they said they were so worried because of the heat waves that, you know, what we're going to do, would they want to have, you know, they have to have, beavers have to have 60 centimeters of, of land underneath water. So you know what they did? They just built bigger, they just pushed the mud up and made it deep enough for them. And they ended up in the process saving the river. Uh, they said, referring to the minimum depth, beavers need to fully submerge in the water to feel safe swimming to and from their lodge. The mammals started to dredge the pond, pushing up little mountains of mud to maintain deeper channels, and basically they um, have kept thousands of species alive that were dependent on the water, creating, quote, wee opportunities for nature, even under difficult conditions. So even in a heat wave, beavers come through. I love how ingenious they are. The beavers kept damming away, holding back the water that often floods the farm and creeps into the sheds, damaging expensive equipment. So beavers make the water work harder to get through the landscape, and they play to their advantage. This to me is absolutely wonderful. Beavers are coming back and people are now realizing that this is, they're releasing these beavers, the picture is they're releasing these beavers in Scotland um, and they're basically rehoming them. And I'm glad it's now not allowed to no longer shoot beavers because they're no longer considered pests. They're not. They are, as I love this guy, magicians. It's another term for them. I just call them the Swiss army knife of animals. But um, I can imagine during a heat wave, the beavers figured out how to, get around it, make make the pan- channels deeper, and save all kinds of things in the process. Um, this is why I think sometimes Amer- uh, human beings think we're really important in the world. Nah, I think the animals have a much better cra- handle on how to live in this world and, and make it better than we do as, as human beings. But um, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV Network. Today we talked about green colonialism. Um, if you have any comments, please send me a a note at kjohnson at johnsonconsults.com. You can also subscribe to my uh, Substack article. You can go up to my website, www.johnsonconsults.com and sign up for my free newsletter. And of course, thanks again for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you next week. You've been watching the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV Network. Have- this has been the KJ Show. Tune in next week as Catherine shares her insights to current changes in the energy industry while drawing on her experience as an energy efficiency consultant for the past 30 years. Right here on the KJ Show.